We are back on the Crownsman Show. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Good to be here. Hello, Gowdy. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Good I'm already morning. I'm already thrown off because I changed my intro and I, I don't think that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta change it up sometimes. Uh, you, you know, have to. You get into the same all the time. And, and I guess it was uh, you know, a little bit fitting because we've got Hawk measurement, um, mm -hmm. part two. Yes, uh, another part two. Another part two. We've done a lot. We've done a lot of part twos in the last. Every everybody came back full circle um, for the <laughs> summer, so that's great. Um, but we have Dave, uh, Dave Grumney on the show. He's the vice president of sales at Hawk Measurement America, so it's going to be a different representative from Hawk uh, today. And when we talk about doing things different and industry changing, industry 4.0, um, we've had a lot of shows where people will talk at a high level about 4.0, but Hawk Measurement is. I don't know if I would say they are industry 4.0, but they are definitely a key component to it. So lots to cover. Before we do that, Gowdy, got to give a shout out to the sponsors. Absolutely. And of course, today we have question of the week. Today's question of the week is answered by Tyson Krupp. Tyson Krupp Industrial Solutions Mining Technologies Division is the market leader in heavy mining equipment for continuous operations from pit to port. This includes crushing and grinding, conveying, as well as materials handling for stockyards and ports. I am happy to welcome Stefan Ebert, head of the product line revamps of Tyson Krupp's mining business. He is here to answer... What potential for optimizations would you recommend to transform existing operations ready for the future? At Tyson Krupp, we are observing quite often a limited holistic view into operations. As a result, we are enforcing a triple assessment, looking into a combination of the pure equipment condition, machine operation itself, and data analytics, especially to detect system bottlenecks. Key level for the future is a proper data quality and set processes to continuously scrutinize operations in a holistic manner, also by frequent expert assessments. That's why we at ThyssenKrupp are absolutely happy to send our experts out into operations, no matter if into pit, processing plant, stockyard, or port. It's our mission to get our know-how into the fields to support a sustainable continuous improvement process and develop the future of mining together with our customers. Next up, we also have General Kinematics. Revolutionize the way you think about screening with General Kinematics STM screen, two-mass vibratory screen. Using General Kinematics proven two-mass technology, this innovative screen is capable of handling increased capacities by up to 40%. With two-mass natural frequency, load surges are no longer a problem. The load responsive design increases retention time, working the material longer, which increases screening efficiency. And of course, all these features combine to provide the most efficient, long-lasting, and lowest cost of ownership screen in the industry. General Kinematics STM screen, screen smarter. You can visit them at generalkinematics.com to learn more. Next up, we also have Cal Tire Mining Tire Group. Whatever your goals, reducing costs, improving uptime, or fulfilling sustainability commitments, Cal Tires Mining Tire Group has proven solutions to help you reach your targets. With proactive planning, tire management innovation, and highly trained team members at Cal Tire, they believe you can expect more at every stage of a tire's life. To learn more, please visit caltiremining.com or email them at info at caltire.com. Next up, we also have Savannah Equipment. Did you know that Savannah Equipment is an electrical supplier in both Canada and the United States? Their electrical inventory includes breakers, disconnects, TEFC, electric motors, tarters, tech cable, cab tire, motor control centers, and transformers. For your new and refurbished electrical equipment, visit SavannahEquipment.com, where you will find more equipment every day. And last but not least, we've got Power Zone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with Power Zone. Visit them at PowerZone.com. There we go. Boom. Got it. <laughs> All right. Dave, welcome to the show. Good well, thank to have you. you on. Thanks, Jared. I'm going to go on a limb here. I don't want to assume things about you, but I, 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 I get the sense you're into golf. I love to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get a chance to often enough, but uh, yes, uh, I do like to play golf. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was thinking when I did this, uh, your, I was going through your website. I have to say, and I genuinely mean this, out of 
any of these larger companies that we've had on, sometimes the smaller companies will have a little fun, you know, they can risk a little more, but your bios are <laughs> quite funny on your website. Like some uh, of them are very funny. That would have been Ellen. Yeah. She's oh, the her? one that, that, that posed the icebreaker question to literally the whole staff. And so, uh, which was actually a great idea. Uh, I didn't know uh, in any of those uh, details in, during, and I interviewed uh, these folks. So it's amazing what you can find <laughs> out when you can ask the question. <laughs> yeah. And it just, it, you, you see, you see little, uh, I, you know, you see smaller companies, a lot of times like, like marketing companies or something like that, they'll have, you know, they'll have funny bios, you know, to try to show sort of creativity and that sort of thing. And I get that, but you know, for a company that works at Hawks level to sort of give people a little window, that, it says something about the company. I, I thought it was quite neat, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was great. Um, I, I really put you on the spot. Uh, there's, uh, you know, I like comedy and all that. And we, it's like one of the worst intros you can do is say, this is the funniest comedian on the planet. And I basically <laughs> said Hawk was industry 4.0 at the intro. So <laughs> I stand it. Yeah. There. But with that said, Hawk is doing some pretty amazing stuff. Can you just sort of give that that overview of who Hawk is as, as a company? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. It, Hawk, for the last over 30 years now, is primarily a, uh, a company that's driven by innovation. Now, that's a real, uh, you know, glitchy thing to say, but um, uh, or, or cli- and, and the cliche really doesn't uh, describe Hawk's DNA, but that is who we are. Uh, Hawk is very innovative um, in in the area of sensor technology. Industry 4.0 in general is driven at the very core. If you boil everything down, the very essence of this new uh, industrial revolution is really all based on the sensor. None of the data that we're going to be talking about later makes sense if you don't have a really good sensor. Mm. So Hawk has really invested heavily in sensor technology. And then on top of that, there's a layer of, okay, how do we integrate this sensor into what we know now is is data-driven acquisitions of of systems, of, of sensors, of field devices, uh, all meshed within the in, the uh, the environment, whether it's a cloud-based environment or a plant uh, network system. Yeah, there's so much hot covers in so many industries. I mean, we were talking offline about the ag sector and uh, municipals, yeah. and I mean, it's just it's just crazy. So, I you know, actually, I had some notes on the to what I wanted to touch about your R and D, but I kind of want to bring that to the beginning because you mentioned the cliche part and and it is a cliche for a lot of companies i i I think if i see the word innovative on another um about Mm -hmm. page i you know i just yeah right it's like well i don't know you you know you you build basically the same thing for 50 years i don't know if we can call that too innovative but it is not the case in hawk i mean you're your r&d like the percentage of revenue that goes to r&d is just it's wild i've never even heard of it to be honest yeah yeah, who takes 25% of their revenue every year, drops it back into R&D. Um, but that, that's what Hawk is. Again, it's, that, it's their DNA. So um, as a vice president of sales, kind of drives me crazy. I'd love to have that. I was going to say, that must you know? be a little bit tricky because you're also, you have customers that are, I mean, they're, they, you've got kind of new innovation all the time. That must be quite the job just to keep that out there getting communicated. That, that's, a, and, and, you know, our, our sales partners will tell you that that's one, one of the things that sets us apart is that these guys keep coming out with these new products yeah. every quarter, you know, and, and uh, it's hard to, to, uh, to, to kind of communicate and stay up on top of, but uh, the process is, is really what uh, kind of blows me away still. Um, the, the process we go through in order to in order to keep developing uh, those products, which we call, you know, innovative. What, what I like to think of is, is a lot more uh, creative uh, because, um, you know, if, if you're if you're in an, involved with a company that is going through that process, we all drift or have a tendency to drift into this. 
let's make whatever is popular at the time. Yeah. And uh, for instance, we're going to be talking about um, tank level measurements primarily uh, during during this time. Well, right now, right now, tank in the world of tank level measurements, what is the popular buzzword everybody is using or product everybody wants to think about is through the air radar. Mm. And um, so when it comes to new products, if we go to our our engineering departments or go into our sales team, what would you like to see? Everybody is like, oh, it has something to do with a through the air radar because that's that's popular. But uh, what we do at Hawk is, um, we, again, we'll, we'll get some of that from our sales channel, but because we want their feedback. But what we really are looking for is what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. And what the salespeople want and what the customer wants is, is sometimes two totally different things. So a lot of the innovation that, that we have ongoing at Hawk, a lot of this R&D investment, has something to do with what, what our sales is bringing, salespeople are bringing to the conversation, but mostly it has what to do, uh, what the customer is bringing to the conversation, which is the reason why we are so um, uh, coming out with new products that, that really are innovative, like really something that nobody else has. Yeah, it, it's amazing. And I think I want to, you know, uh, you know, because I did jump down um, to a section I want to do later on. I want to jump back up, up until to highlight some of the products you know, going into this industry 4.0. And it's sort of, is there a sort of a product that you would sort of tee up for this discussion that you think sort of one represents what, what Hawk is doing, but, but also is, is in high demand in the industry? Great. Yeah. One, one of the field devices that I think um, would be, be a, a good representative, maybe the best representative of, uh, of, of what's a device that you're going to bring to Industry 4.0 is um, our CGR, Guided Wave Radar Device. The, um, the, the CGR is the most flexible of, of level devices that I've, um, that, that I know of in, in the market. Um, it is the uh, it's a device that obviously uh, uh, it not besides can do a lot of things, can solve a lot of problems is the solution for for a lot of what industry is looking for. It's a device that's enabled with power over Ethernet. Mm. And uh, and that power over Ethernet device, that field device is what allows uh, the streaming data that people need for industry 4.0. So it, it addresses a lot of things. Uh, it, it addresses um, issues before they become problems. It addresses uh, this seamless supply chain issue by informing uh, the supply chain, a chemical distributor, a feed producer, mm. where your bulk inventory is, or what your churn rate is for that inventory before any even human intervention happens. It, uh, it allows remote technical services to happen without anyone actually having to come on site or eat, you know, get up on top of a tank. It, it reduces the installation costs mm. because to install a guided wave radar RCGR that's POE enabled, literally all the customer has to do is pull a cat five or cat six cable up with an RJ 45 connector and plug it into the device. No more do we have to rely on expensive uh, electrical uh, contractors type uh, installation costs. It reduces operation cost because literally um, all you, all you need to do is um, connect up to the device and have the device stream the data to your network. It could stream the data to your network and to a programmable logic controller or to a supervisory control and data acquisition system separately, as well as um, any other field device uh, it could connect to and communicate to, uh, to create this mesh of, of devices that are streaming data um, that's gonna be useful uh, in the future. 
Is it, uh, what, what about integration? Uh, that's something I always wonder about when we're talking about th this type of technology and sensors and that is integrating into um, an existing system. And that is that, is that ethernet connection? Does that, does that allow like, like basically a central control station or a computer software? Is it pretty adaptable to all these different systems that the companies are running on? Yeah. Yeah, it's that that's the beauty of it. It's it's completely adaptable. Um, you know, remember um, back in the days uh, when when connected devices first started coming at a, uh, of age, uh, we had things like your printers and other office devices that were plug and play. Well, we're there for industry now, too. Yeah. So the industrial Internet of Things, which is I IOT, is already there now so we can plug it in and with very little or uh, human intervention if at all it will start to connect and stream data to again your network to whatever software you have monitoring the data on your network or um, up to the cloud so it also has the ability to connect to uh, cloud-based software how was it doing it before was it Dave, was mm -hmm. it like, was it like you said, these complex wiring, what would be an example of that? How would you put a, you know, a similar version of this sensor in without the ethernet? Yeah. Yeah. Which was originally how we started off with the third industrial revolution. And that's where the microprocessor was inter, uh, introduced to sensors and those, those microprocessor driven sensors now had the ability to output and they were smart sensors and, and they would output via hard wire. So you would bring wires up to these devices. These wires were connected to the device, the field device on one end, you'd run out these wires uh, individually, depending upon you know, how many field devices you had. And they would all run back to big cabinets what they call IO or input output cabinets. And those input output cabinets then would would come down and connect, hard connect to a, again, a, a computer or programmable logic controller. And, um, and, and of course, that's where your analog signals would, would terminate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that must have been, see, so this is the thing, this is where the R&D comes in. So as a sale, when you're working with your sales team and, and trying to get onto the market, to eliminate all of that, <laughs> that must be right. Sale. Yeah. So what sales team would say is let's make a smarter device. Let's, yeah. but, but they wouldn't be thinking uh, of the innovative part like a customer would. A customer would say, instead of let's make a smarter device, a customer would say, hey, do you have a device that literally just like my home printer or, yeah. you know, I can just connect uh, an RJ45 cable to, and it will, it'll communicate all these field devices on one ethernet cable. It's like, right. well, yeah, we could see if we could do that. <laughs> yeah. It's <clears throat> now I was also curious. So when you, when you come out with a product like this, does that, um, and I'm assuming this is, I mean, this would be well, quick, quite quickly, what this is across, this would be across any industry pretty much, right? Where there's, there needs to be monitoring. Right, this this it's the beauty of it. it. It it can cross any industry. Your imagination really can go wild when you can start thinking of application for it. What would, what would be some examples of like a, a real world application where this would be set up? Yeah, yeah, a lot of real world applications. We were talking a little bit about agriculture. So, in an agriculture plant or a or a feed blending plant, you may have many different uh, silos and tanks, liquids and solids, you're doing blending, you're doing raw material, you're doing finished product uh, inventory, and your task uh, as, as the supply, in the supply chain is to, to bring all this together, to blend it all together, and then to store it, uh, the, the, the uh, finished feed for transport to wherever it's going to be used. Well, you need field devices that can measure the inventories, the, the blend ratios, devices that'll communicate to the control systems for such, 
keep temperatures at the right levels, pressures at the right levels, flow with through the plant at the right levels. And all of those devices when connected have the ability to not only control valves, pumps, things like that, but they also have the ability to monitor which mm -hmm. is different than control. Right. So we want to monitor and stream the data to um, SQL servers within financial platforms uh, to stream the data to, uh, to the cloud. So the people that need to see it can see it 24 seven, regardless of where they're at, right? regardless of what their travel calendar may look like. Um, and so that's, that's some practical application within the agriculture industry that that we're actually even doing. We could do the same thing. You can, you can transport that whole conversation to, uh, to a municipal water wastewater plant where mm -hmm. you know, they have, they have the, the requirement for delivering water services or sewer services 24 seven, and they have to be able to do it uh, remotely as well as, as locally within the plant. I, I have to ask, what happens when you're on the old, one of the older systems and then the new system comes in? Are you able to switch it over? Do the devices get converted? Uh, how, do, how does that setup work if you're dealing with a big, you know, egg facility that now you know, they were on the old system from five years ago? Now they've got yeah. the one that's needed. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Jared. And, and one that that actually was already addressed uh, the answer to it was already addressed in Industry 3.0, or when we, 40 years ago, when we first started introducing uh, the microprocessor to field devices and to control system platforms. Um, what do we do with the industry that is currently using maybe some electronic devices, but a lot, a lot of it is pneumatic, or a lot of it's pneumatic and hydraulic, because Obviously, that was left over from from the second industrial revolution. So uh, you had to you have to do this so so it's um, you can scale the migration or the integration of the new technologies. And in Industry 4.0, you have that same scalability. It might even be easier to to do the scalability within an Industry 4.0 than it was in Industry 3.0. So we can have a blend. Of, of instruments, of field devices, of sensors, of, of um, uh, the, not only the, um, the internet of things, but the internet of systems as well, right, uh, which yeah. is co different control systems all communicating to one another. Um, and so, yeah, we, we can do that in a blended or scalable fashion within Industry 4.0. Are, are companies that you're working with, are they pretty up to date? Like when you come in, are they, are they like someone like myself, if you walked into the room, you'd be, it, it would be, you'd probably have to spend way more time than you want to explaining how it's going to integrate into my system. Cause I'm not really up to date, but are the people that you're talking to, like, like a lot of, I, I would say, what was it? 10 years ago. I've said it many times in the show. They started, yeah. they started hearing the term chief technical officer, seeing a lot more of that. Are you finding that um, companies are coming in and they're, it's a collaboration process. They're kind of already up to speed as opposed to a time when it was like Internet of Things. I remember, yeah, I don't even think it was 10 years ago. Honestly, I don't. And I think yeah, it was like right. CT or something, the Canadian, uh, you know, or Canadian National Radio. And they were saying, you know, there's going to be uh, the Internet of Things, which is going to like, you know, uh, monitor real world applications like it was this crazy concept. And it's just what we live in now. It, yeah. It's, yeah. So uh, are people up to date generally or is there still a lot of education that needs to go into it? Yeah, believe it or not, Jared, that's a great question, too. There there you see the whole the whole map. So, it, you know, in, in one part of the day, I'll be making a presentation or having a conversation and we'll actually the conversation will be uh, answering questions like, well, can I run my Ethernet cable with the power wire all, all in the same tray or all in the same conduit to, um, you know, answering very high level uh, questions about networking or digital communications or speed uh, of communications and these kind of things. So some companies are their their technology officers are already involved and they're asking really high level questions great questions about 
the integration of, of POE field devices. Other companies are just starting to get there. But one common denominator I think that, that we have, one common thread I think we all have is we all understand that if we aren't fully automating our systems with the eye of industry 4.0 um, in, in the near future, the horizon, yeah, we probably aren't going to be be around. Right. Yeah. You just wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to compete now. Right. That's, right. I guess that's what it comes down to. You know, I was just going to touch on something quickly, Dave, is um, the, sort of the, the preventative maintenance side, because that's a key thing. I think we touched on it a little bit um, back in part one of Hawk. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wanted to circle back to it with, with, within the context of CGR. Um, can you sort of map that out for us? Oh, that, that's great. Yeah, within, within all of our, our products, um, we have an eye on preventative maintenance within the field device. So the sensor is, is a good sensors. You know, we make good sensors. They, they, they will measure whatever process or application. But we also want the sensor to have the ability to give us some eye to the future when it comes to maintenance. And that's really that predictive maintenance element is important and super important in this whole conversation of industry 4.0. It's one of the big uh, cost efficiencies you get with industry 4.0. So for instance, we make a sensor that is a, a block shoot sensor. Uh, industry typically uses it if you were going to uh, transfer feed or coal or any any solids through uh, conveyor belts, Jared, and you were transferring through a chute, you'd want to know if that chute was blocked. Because when that chute becomes blocked, let's say if you're transferring coal, it's going to end up all over the floor, all over the plant floor, all over the, the conveyor belt. It'll stop a process dead in its tracks. So we want to be able to sense when the chute is blocked. But even more important than that, we want to sense before the chute gets blocked, when the buildup starts happening on the sidewalls. Well, our block chute detection not only will give you the indication or, or alarm trip when, when the chute is blocked, it'll also start to tell you, hey, your chute's going to be, in two weeks, your chute will be completely blocked. And that's the, uh, that's the power of, um, uh, of power over Ethernet, of streaming data, of communicating data to a control system. Because the control system now alerts the operator, hey, in two weeks, uh, your, your chute will be blocked or into your, our first segment of conversation uh, of, for our um, fiber optics sensing system, it'll tell you, hey, in two or three weeks, your idler number 1043 is going to seize and you're going to have a catastrophic problem. Again, that's all the, the power of that streaming data. When you, uh, when this, you know, when you started working in this sector and the, you started putting these sensors together, did you ever have someone that was maybe a little bit resistant to this type of thing? And then they started getting notifications and this, especially on this preventative maintenance side, I don't, I don't want you to call out a company, of course. Yeah. Does anybody come to mind that like they phoned you and went, oh, this really worked well. <laughs> this, this, this saved me a million or two dollars. <laughs> we believe it or not, this, this happens quite often. So uh, we'll, we'll actually get into these situations, Jared, where the customer, you're having this conversation just like we are. We're telling them what we can do. And of course, you know, they're like, yeah, we'll prove it. Uh, and we will. So we'll set a system up and we'll say, you know, this will tell you, again, you have to listen to it. You have to, you know, don't, don't ignore it because it will tell you uh, two weeks before your shoot gets blocked. Well, sure enough, they ignore it. Because they're like, you know, they'll start getting the data and it'll say, yeah, you've got two, two weeks and, and then all the coal will end up on the floor. And then they'll call us and say, you know what, you were right. <laughs> and uh, we want to go ahead and keep the device and we'll order 10 more. <laughs> Man, yeah. yeah. Oh, I can just, I can just imagine. I, I can... I can just imagine when you've left the room after a pitch to a company that I'm talking about these companies like that didn't have a lot of the sensors in that leading up. To right. You. I could just sense there's two or three people in the room like we've done it this way. It, we, you know, our bottom lines are good. We don't need to start messing around with all these. <laughs> sensors. Right. 
right? And someone's in the room like, yeah, we do. <laughs> yes, we do need to do it. Um, yeah, I'd love to be up. I'd love to be able to fly on the wall after you left the room and those initial, those big investments that they made into set, setting these all up. Um, I wanted to, again, I'm just jumping around a little bit, Dave, but there is off air. We were talking um, in, during the pre-interview. We were talking, and I think it's still in the CGR uh, family uh, of services, is um, the subterranean sewer systems. And I know people on the show are going to be, hopefully there's not a lot of people eating while we're doing this. Um, <laughs> but uh, you told us, like, okay, well, <laughs> we, we have to cover that. For one, the information that you're giving is sort of staggering. Maybe more people know about it than I think. But what you're doing in that space also is very interesting. So I, I just want to kind of turn it over to you to lay it out um, like you laid it out for me. It's very interesting. Right, right. Well, at the beginning uh, of our conversation here, Jerry, we were talking about how flexible the, the CGR, Guided Wave Radar, is. And part of that flexibility is the fact that um, the, the Guided Wave Radar, just as a sensor, has so many advantages over typical level sensors. For instance, one of the limiting factors, if you would, of some level sensors is that they can, um, they can only measure with dielectric ranges that are similar to water, maybe just a little lower than water and up. Uh, our, our guided wave radar can, it can measure just about in any dielectric, all the way down to uh, half a DK, which is insane. And that's unheard of. That allows us to get into applications um, uh, like the one you're talking about, which is um, monitoring the discharge of grease uh, to protect our subterranean sewer systems. So one of the things we all have in common is we live in municipalities that all are battling this, um, the, the proliferation, if you would, of having 40, uh, 50, 60 times more fast food restaurants today than when we built the subterranean sewer system in that municipality, which creates a huge load on the municipality to keep their sewers clean. Because, and again, like you said, I hope you aren't eating, eating, oh, but there's so a, a huge release of, of grease and fats and oils uh, from, from these food service establishments. Well, we make a device that will actually measure the amount of that release. To a municipality, that would be like, you can, uh, because we've never yeah. been able to monitor that before. And yeah, it's because you didn't have the technology, but, but Hawk makes that kind of technology. They, they use you know, 1.54 volts pulse power, where everybody else uses just you know, a, a, a half of, uh, less than a half a volt to that kind of thing. So um, there's all sorts of other highly technical reasons why we can do that. But in any event, we can make that measurement down in the grease trap, believe it or not. You know, everybody kind of knows what a grease trap is. And we make the measurement in the grease trap where the, the uh, water is separated from the fats, oils, and greases. And before the discharge of the fats, oils, and greases goes out into your sewer uh, pipe down into a lift station, clogging up the lift station, creating what's called fatbergs. Uh, we, um, yeah, we can measure that. That, yeah, it's, I kind of, so before that, so before you get to a municipality, what are they doing then? Are they just, they're just discharging and hoping it doesn't build up and doesn't block and like, what, what's, what's the, yeah. no, no, the, the, the municipalities actually, they hire on their payroll uh, inspectors grease trap inspectors really so think of you know if you're in can loops you may have uh 200 food service establishments but you may only have one inspector my inspector can't get around to all 200 food service establishments within you know even a year um so it's important to have automated sensing and communication devices uh, you know in place not to replace the inspector 
but to, to assist the inspector to do their job appropriately, uh, you know, correctly and appropriately in a way where we can determine how much loading of fats, oils, and greases is going to discharge down the sewer to prevent problems in the middle of the night. The problems are things like sewer backups in the basement. What's the end result? Yeah. Yeah, that's only one of the problems. The other problem, Jared, is the, the sewer backs up into the street. So in a rain event, if you see um, areas that look greasy, yeah, that's because the fat soils and greases have come from? up. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, and there's an odor and a health issue with that, as you can imagine. Yeah. I, I you know, we're, we are a business, so we get sponsors. I'm okay with not having fast food sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I eat it, but by myself. But it's just it cannot. It, yeah. I think I think they've done enough research to know that it's not. I don't think anybody's eating it for health reasons. Let's put it that right. way. All but right. that that's just staggering. Yeah, I, and it's so interesting that you say about it. Um, you know, not I'm I'm just kind of people can eat whatever they want but I, i'm so i'm just kind of in jest but it is very interesting that when these municipalities got built they didn't think of right? they didn't think of someone just pumping out burgers and coffee and just just i mean you i drive into locations now i mean there will be like i'm thinking of the one there's well, i think there's four in a tiny complex yeah yeah I don't even know how they stay in business, honestly, other than I'm well, driving through the drive through with everybody else. So I guess that's how they do. But yeah, it, it's a staggering amount. And I never thought of just I, I actually didn't realize that the grease just got discharged down the sewer. I know everybody else listening probably did. I never thought of it. That all of right? that put into the system. Nobody does. Nobody does. But now that you know what you know, now that we've had this conversation, next time. You know, at, through this next year, as you're driving through that intersection where you have four, five, six fed fast food restaurants, there is going to be a collection system somewhere close to there um, where the sewers all tie in. You know, it's it's a sewer tie you've probably heard of. That is going to be needed need to be replaced on somewhat regular basis. And you're going to be amazed. You're going to go, oh, that's why I always see the backhoes over there. Wow. That's yeah, phenomenal. because they're digging it out, cleaning it, putting all, you know, putting all new infrastructure back in on some period, you know, regular basis, just within a mile of me here, this happens on a regular basis. They'll come in after we put lay new concrete, you know, all that stuff, just because of all of this fat soils and greases being discharged. And it, again, it creates, a, it's a health and an environment concern. So, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States has over 40 consent decrees. Uh, that's 40 municipalities or jurisdictions that are being levied fines because of this issue. So it's really? not just an isolated issue. Wow. All right. So the sensors are telling you what the, the levels are, right? They're just controlling it. And then it's up to the cities then to figure out how to how to deal with it and how to not not make it a basically all these issues that are coming out of it right is that that's yeah the that. municipality can't do really anything unless they have the data they have to know how much fat oils and greases uh, are being discharged they have to know even if fat oils and greases are being discharged well the sensors can tell them absolutely not only we can tell you if you have a discharge we can tell you the amount of discharge yeah, that's it, it's amazing. It's amazing stuff. Um, not to get too hung up on it. So I want to talk talk on a couple other things. Um, there's the uh, like when you say like I, like I think you already touched on Paul Master. I think we already talked about that on the last show as well a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Is there sort of any other areas? Maybe maybe the Paul Master. Is, um, is there a couple other areas you'd want to sort of highlight where this sensor really? I mean, I know it's across so many industries, but it, a couple other ones, you kind of where it shines. Well, it really does shine it in any traditional tank or um, or silo uh, or um, bulk container or 55 gallon drum. I mean, again, this sensor is super uh, uh, um, uh, flexible. 
So we can use it in a grease trap. We can put it in a flotation cell uh, in a mining operation where it can sense the, uh, the separation of the pulp and the froth. You could put it in an API separator for oil and gas. Mm. Where you, again, you want to you want to dynamically know the 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 difference between the oil and the water separation with the, for for inside an API separator, and it has all the approvals. It comes with the the Canadian registration numbers, and you know it's uh, it's just a super flexible device. That's the the, the Hawk measurement CGR is uh, is probably used over more platforms than, than any other field device I know of. I was, I, I remember the question I was going to ask. Um, it was about support systems um, once installation is done. Um, mm -hmm. How is that, like your distribution model, is it, I, I've seen companies, I think we've maybe even had some on that are Hawk distributors. Do I have that mm -hmm. right? You, do, yeah. you work through distributors, yeah. right? What yeah, we have, we have manufacturers reps that are, that are dual role. They're manufacturers representatives that are also uh, distributors. So they can buy, resell, they can, you know, they represent us in, in, in known areas. And then what about the support once the systems are in place? Like who, who's actually providing that technical support? Right. It's either locally via the distributor or manufacturers reps, or they're trained. They have trained technicians that are, that are factory trained that can locally support their support that we offer remotely. So mm -hmm. um, again, because we make smart enabled devices, uh, internet enabled devices, POE devices. Uh, it literally a technician can, um, can log into the device from Melbourne, Australia, all the way over to, uh, to Calgary and, and communicate to the device real time uh, and, and diagnose an issue um, with either with the device or with the process. Uh, and, and all without entering the, the site or climbing up on the tank or any number of things. We could do that remotely. We do have factory trained technicians as well. So we can support uh, any device or, or customer uh, with our factory trained personnel. It's, it's really amazing, you know, for us, like we're, we've just, uh, we're actually just having a new host come on our energy show um and uh he's going to be located our our command center is going to be here we're producing the show for him remotely and the guest is going to be in another location in the world and we're producing it all from here it's just it's absolutely amazing what you can do and i think it's yeah. easy, it's easy to get used to it really fast you go oh, this is the way it's done now but yeah it's absolutely yeah. amazing the connectivity now that you can take advantage of um and i i will say some people you know i know a lot of people want to get back to the in-person meetings I like the hybrid. I like that we can meet in person, but I, I'm sure the same for you. It used to be, it was almost rude to uh, do a, like a video stream. So you'd spend the whole day, <laughs> going right? To meet somebody you have, you know, you get the check, you end up having lunch. It's just like, okay, that was four hours. <laughs> now, yeah. It's like, yeah, Jared, if it, Imagine if you're in sales management and you, uh, you know, I've got 250 manufacturers reps, individuals uh, out of 23 rep firms now um, that, that wow. I oversee. And before hiring them, I used to have to go out and interview, personal interview. Now we can do most of that. In fact, you know, almost all of it uh, virtually. It just yeah. saves a tremendous amount of money. And time and efficiency is just increased exponentially. Yeah, and, and I, I'm sure for a company like Hawk, where like that R&D component, I mean, that is just, that, that must be a big advantage, actually, for you. And yeah. I, I should ask about it. Of course, um, we, we don't want to get dinged for using the words, but everybody knows about what's, you know, gone on in the last almost two years now. This has been going on, you know, lockdowns and all this type of thing. Um, Oop, you companies... use the word. Oh, no. <laughs> It'll be fine. It'll be fine, Gaddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, couldn't help myself. But, uh, the it, when we're w for a company like Hawk, it must be because they're innovative and that sort of some of these that must be a big advantage for you, being able to sort of streamline your communication and support systems and everything like that. We it is. It's uh, the the fact that we have. 
uh, video, you know, the old video conferencing now is on so many platforms, so many web platforms. And um, so we can really reach out to, to literally any corporate from any location. Uh, we can do this internally as well on, on just about any platform. And when we're globally headquartered in Melbourne, Australia, and I think uh, without using any of the the terms, we know what, what situation <laughs> Melbourne is in right now. Um, yeah, yeah, no it, kidding. But it's, so it's imperative that we, we, you know, I'm not able to fly, make the 23 hour uh, trip by plane to, to go there. So it's imperative yeah. that we run the operation the way we do and having uh, all the, the digital data uh, up on cloud platforms, super secured. Um, and, and, and uh, it's just yeah wouldn't be able to do it without it yeah it's it's we are we are living in an amazing amazing time in history i mean it, it's not all perfect but you know but i think it's easy to get hung up on some of the especially if you watch too much news you know i i learned i do not watch the news or listen to it before i do these shows yeah so i did right. it a couple times and i couldn't do the show properly it just <laughs> It just messes you up. And I know, I know personally that it does because I saw the difference. But we start focusing on what we're accomplishing and how we're putting it all together. It's pretty amazing what people are doing. It really is. Yeah. Um, Dave, thanks for coming on the show. It's, it's great. I mean, Hawk is just, you know, it's why we built the show. It's about, you know, technical information and showing innovation and what industry is doing and how it's making it more official, uh, efficient and making industry better. I mean, and Hawk represents that right from top to bottom. So I uh, genuinely appreciate you coming on. Thanks for Ellen for putting it all together for us. Uh, it's just been yeah. great working with Hawk. Thanks, Jared. Okay. Gowdy, that was part two. Um, it, it had a completely different feel to it, Absolutely. completely different topics. So, um, and I think our audience is, is a lot bigger since last time. So For a lot sure. of new people will be seeing it. It's going to be great. No, I think these part twos have been super great because I mean, a lot of people go, what, what else can I talk about? And there's just so much, I mean, just an hour, everybody goes, oh my God, what am I going to say? Oh, you have no idea long. how many times many and, people have been on an hour. Yeah. Really? <laughs> um, <laughs> but an hour is not enough. Um, so these part twos are always that much better because yeah. they go oh my god yeah maybe they'll discuss that one thing i i wanted to know so it's really good yeah and a lot of times too i find when the the first time a company comes there's a lot of sort of macro discussion which is yeah. is good but it also doesn't necessarily relate to someone who is maybe not you know maybe they're working for a municipality it doesn't maybe right whereas this will actually resonate with them so you get yeah. to really dig in which is what our audience likes so yeah um gowdy where can people like, follow, subscribe, share, comment, make fun of us, whatever they'd like? <laughs> You're just always looking for controversy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm looking for in my day. <laughs> um, definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, like, share our videos. We've got two, three episodes a week on there. Um, and I feel like there's just sometimes there's like about four. Um, we also have Change Itself, which their episode four, they I believe. They're so good. Yes. You have to check that out. Yeah. Episode four is um, they're actually shooting, I believe, next week. So in two weeks, you'll have you'll be able to see episode four of Change Itself um, and it, contact us if you want to be on the show, uh, whether it's the Crownsman Show Mining Now, Crownsman Energy, Crownsman Egg, contact us info at crownsman.com. Perfect. Thank you, Gaddy. Thank you, Dave, again, for coming on the show. Uh, we love doing these episodes and we will. And thank you to the audience. Wow. Look at my manners. <laughs> thank you to the audience for watching. We love, love bringing you these shows and, and the support industry is giving us and, and that and they're giving us that support because you've been watching. So thank you and see you on the next episode of The Crownsman Show.